incredible architecture, a massive army and navy, and maybe the most ultra-modern society ever, all happening 12,000 years ago. They say it vanished in a single day and single night, like poof, gone in a blink. But did it really? I mean, did it even exist in the first place? Welcome to the in-between. I'm Carol Ann, and today we're diving deep into the mystique surrounding one of history's greatest legends, the lost city of Atlantis. We've all heard the word Atlantis tossed around more times than we can count. I mean, there are movies, books, articles, countless documentaries, you name it, all about this mythical city. And even now, over 3,000 years after its story was first told by Plato, we're still captivated by the legend of this lost city. Now, for those who've managed to keep your eyes open during philosophy class, the name Plato should ring a bell, right? For sure, he was a heavyweight in historical thinkers who lived in Greece from 427 to 348 B.C. In his dialogues, Timaeus and Cretius, Plato paints this picture of a super rich island nation set out in the Atlantic Ocean beyond what they called the Pillars of Hercules, which we now know today as the Strait of Gibraltar. According to Plato, Atlantis wasn't just your run-of-the-mill island. It was like the Las Vegas of the ancient times with crazy wealth, cool gadgets, and an army that could make anyone think twice about messing with them. So if Plato was so hyper-focused on this whole Atlantis saga, maybe we should pay more attention to it. Plato's account of Atlantis is said to have been inspired by the writings of Solon, an Athenian statesman and lawmaker who reportedly acquired knowledge of this ancient civilization during his travels to Egypt around 600 BC. It is believed that Solon learned of Atlantis from Egyptian priests who recounted the story of a magnificent island nation that had existed thousands of years before their time. Plato describes Atlantis as being larger than both Libya and Asia Minor combined. So if Atlantis was bigger than both of those put together, that is a seriously gigantic piece of land, more like a continent than just some rinky-dink island. And according to Plato, it possesses an abundance of natural resources and is particularly rich in metals, including the famous and mysterious Oracalcum. According to him, the capital of Atlantis is situated on the southern coast of the island with a massive canal linking it to the sea. The city has a circular layout divided into three concentric rings separated by moats. The central citadel spans about three miles across, while the entire urban area extends over 14 miles, making it roughly twice the size of Imperial Rome. And at the center of the island are the Palace of the Kings and the main Temple of Atlantis. Legend has it that the Atlanteans are incredibly wealthy, with riches unparalleled by any other ruler in history. They don't hesitate to import whatever they lack from foreign lands, showcasing the grandeur of their empire. According to Plato, the Atlanteans unfortunately follow the well-worn path of many other too-good-to-fail civilizations and go from living the high life to becoming corrupt and power-hungry. They get greedy, expansionist, and lose their sight of the literal paradise that they're sitting on. Due to their overinflated ego, Atlantis picks a fight with Athens. When the Athenians and their allies step up, it's like a showdown of who's boss among the Greeks. But the gods are always watching. And what happens when you piss off the gods? Epic reality check. Cue the divine beatdown. Earthquakes, floods, and all sorts of natural disasters. It's like the ultimate punishment for getting too big for their britches. Plato writes, And in a single day and night of misfortune, all your warlike men in a body sank into the earth, and the island of Atlantis, in like manner, disappeared in the depths of the sea. So that is the story of Atlantis. But is it true? 
While some people think Plato was just messing around, using the story of a mythical land to sneak in some deeper meaning, you know, like hiding your dog's pill in a piece of hot dog, others still swear Atlantis was the real deal. Years go by, and as the world enters the Middle Ages, most old writings, including Plato's tales of Atlantis, get lost like dust in the wind. Dust? Wind. Dude. But when the Renaissance rolls around, people once again get curious about this lost island. And for the last 500 years, people have come up with all sorts of ideas about this vanished continent in the Atlantic. But do these ideas match up with what Plato said? And who were the Atlanteans anyway? How did they build that civilization? Some folks even wonder if aliens had a hand in it all. One interesting and kind of out there idea about Atlantis comes from Ishmael Perez, who wrote a book called Cosmic Origin. He thinks Atlantis was created by humanoid beings from the Pleiades and from a whole different dimension. These beings managed to mix together the spiritual and physical worlds, which led to some super advanced technology that combined the physical with the spiritual. On a totally different hand, we have the teachings of theosophy, in which humanity evolves through seven big cycles called root races. Each cycle has its own set of physical and mental traits that are different from the previous one. And Atlanteans were the fourth cycle, seen as the first truly human and earthly race. Helena Blavatsky, a co-founder of the Theosophical Society, had some fascinating ideas about Atlantis. According to Helena, the Atlanteans were superhuman beings who appeared way before us regular humans showed up. In her chronology, the Atlantean root race emerged after the decline of the Lemurians, which she places hundreds of thousands of years ago, long before any known historical civilization. In her book, The Secret Doctrine, she vividly describes how Atlantis met its end. According to her, it was a result of a massive catastrophe triggered by the misuse of advanced technology and spiritual corruption. Blavatsky believed this cataclysm was the inspiration behind many flood stories found in mythology, including those in the Bible. It was actually Helena who came up with the idea that the Atlanteans were the fourth of seven root races, while the Lemurians were the third root race. Now, let's dive into this third root race because, let me tell you, the similarities between this and Atlantis are fascinating. Lemuria, or Mu, is this mysterious lost continent often linked with the vast expanse of the Indian Ocean. It all started in the 19th century when people tried to make sense of why certain plants and animals, namely lemurs, were found in disparate places like India and Madagascar. Zoologist Philip Sclater threw out the idea of Lemuria back in 1864. He's like, hey, what if there was this land bridge in the past that connected Madagascar and India? Over time, the concept grew, and suddenly, we're talking about a submerged continent lurking beneath the Indian Ocean. Legends say that the Lemurians were masters of tapping into nature's energy and spiritual forces. They might have even dabbled in some cool technology. But you know how it goes— Human greed supposedly caused their content to vanish into the depths of the ocean. Where have we heard that one before? There's a whole treasure trove of information on Lemuria, and we may do a video on them in the future, but if you want more information about them now, feel free to check out our video on Mount Shasta, where we talk about them and their connection to the mountain. Now, getting back to Atlantis, let's talk about another intriguing perspective. Enter Rudolf Steiner, a philosopher and esotericist who had his own take on the origin of the Atlanteans. Steiner believed that Atlanteans didn't exactly belong to Earth. According to theosophical teachings, they were described as giants, taller than the Lemurians, but not quite as massive, which gave rise to all sorts of fascinating legends about Cyclops and Titans, adding yet another layer of mystery. 
Now, while those mystical and high-tech theories about Atlantis are certainly intriguing, some experts have a different perspective, one that's a bit more grounded in geology. Some think Atlantis might have been a volcanic landmass linked to Europe, Africa, and North America by temporary land connections. According to them, Atlantis reached its peak size around 5.3 million years ago, forming a nearly unbroken stretch of land from what we know as the North American continent to the southern tip of Africa. Then there's another tale. One that talks about the Galactic Federation, an interstellar council composed of various advanced civilizations from all over the universe. This federation is said to oversee the development and interactions among different planetary systems and their inhabitants, ensuring the evolution of consciousness and the maintenance of cosmic balance. According to Matthias de Stefano, self-proclaimed indigo child, Atlantis got its start around 16,000 BC and was built by the Azir, these giant extraterrestrials also known as the Anunnaki. Now, amazingly enough for a channel like ours, I don't think we've ever mentioned the Anunnaki before, and I'm sure that we will talk about them in depth in the future, but for now, I'm just going to give you a brief overview. Just like the story of Atlantis, the idea of the Anunnaki comes from ancient Mesopotamian writings that date back to 3000 BC. The name Anunnaki basically means those who came from the heavens or princely offspring in Sumerian. These guys were like super powerful gods who supposedly played a huge role in creating humanity in the whole universe, according to the Sumerians. And according to Matthias, these guys set up shop in the Middle East and got busy mixing their DNA with us earthlings to create what they thought was the perfect life form. Their offspring? The Atlanteans, of course. They were chosen to hold on to the knowledge and truth passed down from the star people. With their fancy Anunnaki DNA, these Atlanteans were all about high tech and cosmic know-how. They could allegedly tweak the world around them using sound and vibrations. But as these stories go, things took a turn. Some Atlanteans got greedy with their tech, leading to a big disaster. Sound familiar? Another guy who breathed life into the tale of Atlantis was Ignatius L. Donnelly. Imagine this. By day, he's a U.S. congressman from Minnesota, but by night, he's a part-time scientist with a penchant for stirring up controversy. His claim to fame? Penning the book, Atlantis, the Antediluvian World, published in 1882. Donnelly painted Atlantis as the creme de la creme of civilizations, spawning ancient cultures like the Maya. He even dropped bombshells, like claiming the Garden of Eden was situated in Atlantis, and that it all sank due to the big flood talked about in the Bible. Donnelly wasn't just throwing spaghetti at the wall when it came to Atlantis. He had a whole buffet of hypotheses, 13 to be exact. He dove into the deep end, suggesting everything from Plato's tale being legit to Atlanteans worshiping the sun and being the OG human civilization. He even threw in a wild theory about the Greek gods moonlighting as Atlantis's rulers. Now, Donnelly knew folks laughed off Atlantis as a bedtime story, but he compared the skeptics to those who scoffed at Pompeii and Herculaneum before they were discovered. And guess what? Just a decade before Donnelly dropped his Atlantean bombshell, German archaeologist Heinrich Schliemann stumbled upon Troy, proving Homer's Iliad wasn't just a fairy tale. Okay, so Donnelly didn't unearth Atlantis with a shovel, but his ideas sparked a wildfire of theories. From James Churchward's Tales of Mew, or Lemuria if you prefer, to other sunken cities popping up around the globe, plenty of people are still holding out hope for the discovery of Atlantis. 
Who knows? Maybe one day we'll stumble upon that lost city and old Donnelly will get the last laugh after all. Another theory that delved deep into the realm of Atlantis comes from an unexpected source, the Nazis. But hold on to your hats because their obsession with Atlantis reached levels of the downright bizarre. In Nazi lore, they got so obsessed with Atlantis that they started mixing its legends with their own warped Aryan myths. In the twisted minds of Nazi ideologues, Atlantis wasn't just a myth. It was the holy grail of their Aryan supremacy fantasies. Athanasius Kircher, a historical cartographer, even drew up maps placing Atlantis smack dab in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. But the real star of this strange show was a fellow named Jörg Blantz von Liebenfels. He cooked up an esoteric doctrine called Ariosophy, which prophesied the resurgence of a lost Aryan civilization. And guess who he thought the descendants of these mythical godmen were? You guessed it, the Germans. Now, before you start picturing Thor sipping mead in Valhalla, let's set the record straight. The Nazi notion of Aryan superiority was about as factual as a unicorn riding a rainbow. Sure, the word Aryan originally referred to people of Indo-European descent, but the Nazis took it to a whole new level of crazy. They were so desperate to connect with their supposed ancient ancestors that they went globetrotting in search of the elusive Aryans. Led by the notorious Heinrich Himmler, the SS dispatched expeditions to Tibet, Sweden, and even Bolivia, all in pursuit of the mythical master race. Now, you might be wondering, why Bolivia? Well, one Nazi archaeologist, Edmund Kiss, believed that Bolivia's Tiwanaku ruins were none other than the remnants of Atlantis. While in Tibet, the Nazi scientists meticulously measured the facial features of the local inhabitants. Their goal? To confirm their fervent belief that the Tibetans were none other than the descendants of the mythical Atlanteans. As the calipers clicked and the measurements were recorded, the team grew increasingly convinced that their bizarre hypothesis was true. According to their skewed logic, the similarity in facial features between the Tibetans and their imagined Aryan ancestors was undeniable proof of their lineage. However, far from celebrating their supposed discovery, their findings sent a chill down Himmler's spine. The notion that the pure Aryan bloodline had become diluted over centuries drove him a little closer to crazy town. In his twisted mind, this revelation stirred thoughts of a need to safeguard racial purity. Thus, fueled by paranoia and bigotry, Himmler doubled down on his sinister quest to re-engineer the master race. And we all know what happened next. The quest for Atlantis didn't stop there, though. It's been a wild ride for adventurers everywhere, from the heights of Bolivia to the shores of Spain and even the frosty plains of Antarctica. Folks have been on the lookout for this mythical city. Just a couple of years back, around 2016, a bunch of history buffs from North Yorkshire, England, the Merlin Burroughs Company, decided to dive into the hunt. Armed with ancient text and satellite data, they set their sights on Spain's Doñana National Park. Bruce Blackburn, CEO of Merlin Burroughs, described it as a mix of excitement and eyebrow-raising skepticism. Their adventure was like a good old-fashioned treasure hunt. They stumbled upon some ancient-looking stuff along the Spanish coast. There were these big circles that might have been towers and even some ruins that looked like they belonged to Poseidon himself. But wait, there's more. They dug up some stone samples that could have been ancient concrete dating back a whopping 10 to 12,000 years. Now, Merlin Burroughs isn't the only crew to claim they've hit the jackpot. National Geographic and a bunch of others have thrown their hats in the ring, pointing fingers at Doñana as Atlantis's possible location. The place has history dripping from every corner, with evidence of human habitation there for over 5,000 years. But hold your horses. Some scholars are wagging their fingers, saying, now hang on just a minute. 
They're not convinced that what Merlin Burroughs found lines up with the fancy descriptions Plato wrote ages ago. One such skeptic is Mark Adams, an author and adventurer who was a little less than convinced. He says, sure, some things match up, but where are the concentric circles Plato talked about? And what about all the opulent treasures Poseidon's temple was supposed to have? He's got a point. But the fact that they unearthed concrete dating back 12,000 years ago says a lot, don't you think? Well, that brings me to some scholars who think they've cracked the code and found the real Atlantis, or at least the civilization that inspired Plato to dream up the fictional one. That civilization would be the Minoans. You see, just like the Atlanteans, the Minoans were big shots on the high seas, ruling over several islands in the Aegean Sea. They weren't around 9,000 years ago before Plato, but they did beat him to the punch by a solid 900 years. The Minoans had their fair share of bad luck, too. Sometime between 1611 and 1538 BC, a massive earthquake rocked the island of Santorini, wrecking a big chunk of the Minoan navy. Now here's where things get interesting. The Minoans were pretty impressive in their own right. They built fancy palace complexes like the ones you see in Knossos and Phaistos, made beautiful artwork with colorful paintings and pottery, and had a fancy social system and trade routes. And guess what? Atlantis, according to Plato, was a lot like that too. A super smart civilization with amazing buildings and a thriving society. And get this, both the Minoans and the mythical Atlanteans were big on boats. The Minoans were awesome sailors who ruled the seas with their trade routes all across the Mediterranean. And Atlantis? Well, it is said to be this powerful empire that owned the oceans. I'm starting to see the resemblance here. But while Atlantis is said to have gone down in an anthropomorphic geological blaze of glory, the Minoan civilization didn't go out because of that earthquake that wrecked their navy. It was toppled by something much more mundane, a good old-fashioned economic collapse, which didn't really rear its ugly head until the 15th century AD. But here's the million-dollar question. Did Plato mix up these two calamities when spinning his yarn about Atlantis? There's definitely enough evidence to make a solid case. I mean, just look at the Aegean Sea. It's sitting right on top of a hot spot where the African tectonic plate slides beneath the Eurasian one. With all that seismic activity, it's no wonder the place has seen its fair share of disasters over the years. So if Plato was actually referring to the ancient Minoan civilization, then all those wild theories about Atlanteans might just be a load of horse hockey. However, there's one captivating tale that has archaeologists and experts thinking that Atlantis may just be real. So what is it? Well, it all revolves around a fascinating prediction made by American mystic Edgar Cayce back in 1938. Cayce was often hailed as one of the big shots in the prophecy business, with over 14,000 readings under his belt. He's like the psychic heavyweight champ after Nostradamus, and he was pretty darn accurate, too. Casey wasn't your typical fortune teller, though. He wasn't in it for the cash or the fame. He dished out psychic readings like candy and helped folks in dire straits without asking for a dime in return. But beyond lending a hand to the troubled masses, he had a knack for peeking into the past and future, including the fabled lost city of Atlantis. Now, buckle up for a wild ride through Casey's visions of Atlantis. According to the man himself, a brand spanking new chunk of land was set to pop up off the east coast of North America around 1968 or 1969. The legendary Rising of Atlantis. Casey painted Atlantis as the OG civilization light years ahead of our modern tech. He claimed its last remaining islands vanished into the depths of the Atlantic some 10,000 years back, leaving behind nothing but myth and mystery. And he was pretty detailed in his description. 
Picture a landmass as big as Eurasia that eventually split into three major chunks, Poseida, Og, and Aryan. And he described some pretty advanced technology, including the use of quantum theory, silicon chips, and lasers. We're talking crystal and sound-powered healing, elevators and tunnels navigated with steam and compressed air, and mining operations that put our modern methods to shame. Casey claimed they also had the capability of mass mental telepathy, psychokinesis, and astral projection into fourth-dimensional consciousness. He also said they were the creators of the crystal skulls, which are a collection of human skulls with supernatural powers carved out of clear or milky quartz, supposedly with precision that no modern tool could have replicated. Side note, the Smithsonian and the British Museum, both of which have one of these skulls in residence, will beg to differ with that claim. But again, a video for another day. But back to Atlantis. Eventually, the people split into two groups, one called the Children of the Law of One, who were all about spiritual growth and working together, and the other called the Sons of Belial, who were all about power. These two rival factions duked it out for control, the peace-loving hippie Children of the Law of One versus the greedy Sons of Belial. And when the dust settled, Atlantis was toast. But the plot thickens. Casey hinted at a sneaky exodus to ancient Egypt before Atlantis went belly up and even claimed the great flood of Noah was the fallout of their watery demise. Rumor has it that they buried the keys to their kingdom under the Sphinx's paw. Fast forward to today and the mystery of Atlantis still has us all hooked. Some say the truth lies beneath the Sphinx, while others argue it's all just ancient lore. But one thing's for sure, Edgar Cayce's visions of Atlantis have kept us guessing for decades, shining a light on humanity's past, present, and maybe even its future. And while digging for more clues, I found something amazing. Remember when Cayce predicted that a part of Atlantis would pop up? Well, guess what? It did. In 1968, some divers stumbled upon a bunch of limestone rocks near North Bimini in the Bahamas. They called it the Bimini Road, and it's got some serious Atlantis vibes. Now, the Bimini Road sits about 18 feet below the surface of the sea and stretches straight for about a half a mile before gracefully curving at the end. The road is made up of limestone blocks, each one looking like it was cut with precision. They're big, too, ranging from 10 to 13 feet long and 7 to 10 feet wide. Some of them even look like they're propped up, as if someone was trying to make them all the exact same height, like a smooth road. It's like a giant Atlantean puzzle piece falling into place. Let me tell you, thanks to Casey's supposed Bimini Road prophecy, I'm a little more inclined to listen to the other things he has to say. Now, some Atlantis enthusiasts, and even a few archaeologists, have suggested that this road could be the real deal, a pathway to Atlantis. And Graham Hancock, an ancient civilization researcher, recently got up close and personal with the Bimini Road for his Netflix series, Ancient Apocalypse, leaving viewers with much less doubt than ever of the structure being man-made and thousands of years old. I mean, kind of makes sense, right? It looks like a road, and the features seem to line up with what Plato described about Atlantis. However, despite all the hype surrounding it, in the decades since its discovery... Nothing else has really linked it to the actual city of Atlantis. But let's think about this for a second. Throughout history, we've seen entire civilizations wiped out by all sorts of natural disasters. Tsunamis, volcanoes, earthquakes. And sometimes all it takes is stumbling upon something as simple as a road or a pot or a piece of art to uncover the truth about these ancient cultures. So why should Atlantis be any different? Who's to say that the Bimini Road isn't just the beginning? Maybe there's a whole treasure trove of Atlantean relics waiting to be discovered beneath the ocean's depths. Take the Antikythera mechanism, for example. 
discovered in 1901, it's an ancient Greek computer dating back to the second century BC. This incredible device was used for astronomical and calendrical purposes, which pretty much means that whoever made it had some pretty advanced technology. Some believe that such sophistication could only come from a highly advanced civilization like Atlantis. The Antikythera mechanism lay underwater for over 2,000 years as part of a shipwreck off the coast of the Greek island of Antikythera. It slowly corroded beneath the water, buried under sand and wreckage. Then in 1901, a group of sponge fishermen stumbled upon the wreck and its treasures while diving for dinner. A year later, in 1902, Spiridon Stace, a Greek archaeologist who had organized the underwater excavation of the wreck, visited the museum housing the wreck's treasures. Amidst the artifacts, he spotted a green rusted lump of metal, a piece of the ancient computer now known as the Antikythera mechanism. And remember way back in the beginning when I talked about that legendary metal or a calcum being linked to Atlantis? Well, a crew of underwater explorers stumbled upon a treasure trove of 200 metal ingots lying on the sandy seafloor near a 2600 year old shipwreck off the coast of Sicily. And guess what those ingots were made of? Or a calcum. The rare metal Plato said came from the mythical city of Atlantis. They found a whopping 39 ingots near the wreck and another stash of 47 more ingots later on. That is a grand total of 86 pieces of this mysterious metal discovered so far. The shipwreck itself was found back in 1988, a little less than a thousand feet off the coast of Jella in Sicily's shallow waters. I don't know about you, but the fact that it is mentioned in Plato's book and it was found thousands of years later, it's pretty dang convincing. And you know what's even more convincing? The remains of the Temple of Melkart and Hercules Gaditanus in Spain look eerily similar to how Plato described the buildings of Atlantis. The way it's designed and laid out matches up with Plato's descriptions of the main city of Atlantis. Then there's Cleopatra's Palace in the port of Alexandria in Egypt. Imagine you're out for a swim, minding your own business, and suddenly you look down into the water to see sphinxes and statues staring back up at you. Yup, that's it. Discovered in the late 90s by French businessman turned archaeologist Frank Gaudio. But wait, it gets even wilder. Ever heard of the ancient city of Heracleion, also known as Thonis in Egypt? This place was the stuff of legends. Helen of Troy and her man Paris would sometimes pop by for visits. Everyone thought this was just a tall tale until the same guy, Frank Gaudio, found this sunken city in 2000, lurking beneath the waves about 20 miles northeast off the coast of Alexandria. Alexandria was really a hopping place. All these places were once thought to be as real as unicorns and mermaids. But guess what? They're real. So who's to say Atlantis isn't out there somewhere, just waiting for someone to find it? Maybe one day we'll be sipping on pina coladas in an underwater Atlantean resort, laughing about how everyone used to think it was just a fairy tale. And on that note, have you heard about the Eye of the Sahara? Some folks think this bizarre formation in the Sahara Desert could be the actual ruins of Atlantis. If you want us to dig into this crazy theory, let us know in the comments below and we might just make a video about it. Now, if you haven't heard enough about the Atlanteans and Lemurians, you will definitely not want to miss this video here that goes over one of the most popular theories of what happened to them all those years ago and where they might be today. Be careful out there. And I will see you here again on The In-Between.